Hey, what's going on? Pastor Tanks here, Reach City Church. And I just wanted to get on here really quick before uh, you enjoy uh, this Resurrection Sunday message, Hope is Alive, because Jesus has risen. We know that our hope is still alive. I just wanted to get on here really quick to let you guys know who we are as Reach City Church. We are an urban church plant in the Cleveland area. Uh, we were set to launch in May 3rd, but all of the social distancing and things has obviously pushed that back, but it is okay. God is still in control. Jesus is still alive, and so we're not worried about um, what, what that's going to look like. We're just waiting on when we are able uh, to begin to, to launch this ministry publicly. Uh, but we are a ministry that is committed to seeing people and communities made whole. And our strategy for it is not big likes and all of that. Our strategy is to simply uh, make disciples who makes disciples who makes disciples who makes disciples. Our word is to be reproducers. And listen, we see that right from the Bible. Jesus created a world movement by calling men to follow him. And he said, and I will make you fish of men. Because he taught 11 men how to be fishers of men, the Bible says in Acts 17 that they turned the world upside down. The entire Christian movement began because Jesus taught men how to fish for men. He taught men how to be disciples of men. And so we believe that if we do that here in our community of Ward 7 in Cleveland, Ohio, that we can see transformation like none other here in our city. So we are committed to discipleship. Listen, if we would love for you to be a part of this ministry. If you don't belong somewhere, you're looking for a ministry to join, Reach City Church is a place for you. If you have a heart for discipleship and growing, Reach City Church is a place for you. And so I want you to do me a favor if you're interested. Visit the uh, link, www.reachchurchcle.com and click the Get Involved tab and fill out the Get Involved tab uh, and we will get back to you. We would love to connect with you. We would love to see how God may be calling us to partner together and serve together at Reach City Church. Again, my name is Leonard Tanks. I am the pastor of this uh, wonderful church plant, and I look forward to hearing from you. Hey, enjoy your day and enjoy the message. God bless. Again, thank you for tuning in and worshiping with us here at Reach City Church. Listen, today is a special day. <laughs> Listen, today the tomb was empty, and the tomb was not empty because uh, somebody stole his body. The tomb was not empty because Jesus wasn't truly crucified. The tomb was empty because the dead has no place amongst the living, and we do not serve a dead God, but a living God. And so today, 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 wherever you are, wherever you're watching this from, wherever you're listening to this from, I need you to do me one quick favor and shout as loud as you can, thank you, Jesus! Today is truly a day of thanksgiving. Today is truly a day that can never be forgotten or passed over. Today we celebrate the most historic event in all of world history. And it is a day that should remind us that in the face of everything that we deal with, Despite this world pandemic, despite the struggles and your hardship, despite what the testimony of the doctors say, despite the difficulties of the dream, despite the worldly disqualifications and fears and inadequacies, despite feeling defeated, today reminds us, and the title of this message is that hope is alive. Hope is alive. If you've been following us, I have been preaching a series of messages that deal with hope and how we should place our hope in Christ and Christ alone because he is the solid rock on which I stand. All others are surely, surely sinking sand. So today we're going to continue. We're going to continue in this hope series uh, because today hope is alive. Today we celebrate that hope has a name and his name is Jesus. And I think it's a perfect day to do that. Right. Uh, to celebrate Jesus Christ, to celebrate hope, Jesus Christ, the hope of Israel, presumed dead, but resurrected in the story in Luke 24, verses 13 through 36. We see a narrative of Christ down of Christ followers being downcasted and hopeless. And listen, I'm about to just not beat around the bush. They were downcasted and hopeless because they put their hope in Jesus and he died. 
<laughs> and that is what we're going to be talking about today. We're, we're not going to be talking about misplaced trust. We're not going to be talking about a misplaced hope in material things. We're going to be talking about what happens when we actually put our hope in Jesus and feel let down. And the reason we have to go here is because I've been talking about this misplaced trust. I've been talking about this misplaced hope. But maybe you've been watching and following our series. And each week you say to yourself, yeah, but I am trusting in Jesus. I'm not trusting in my bank account. I'm not trusting in, mil in, 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 in relationships. Uh, I've been trusting in Jesus. And maybe your disappointment, therefore, is not the failure of money and relationships, but it's with Jesus. However, in the narrative, we will see how by the end of this conversation, the hope of these followers of Christ who were downcasted and hopeless has been changed. And they've gone from, uh, they've been, had this renewed hope and they've become world changers. Downcasted followers into a group of bold and unstoppable evangelists were changed. I'm not going to make you wait. What they thought was dead was still alive. What changed? What they thought was dead was still alive. Look with me to Luke 24. And let's begin with verse 13. Today, two of them were going to a village uh, uh, named Emmaus and about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other uh, uh, about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing these things, here it is. Jesus drew himself near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And, and, and we, we, I thought I would get into a theological thing right here. But, but Jesus did not allow them to recognize who he was. And, and there's different schools of thoughts on why this is happening, and we're not going to get into that today. But what we know is that Jesus disguised himself uh, until he was ready for himself to be revealed. And we know that, listen, this is just a theological truth that we should never forget in life anywhere. Unless God reveals himself to us, we could never know who he is. We didn't find him on our own, search for him on our own. Uh, listen, he made himself known to us. And until he makes himself known to people, we cannot know who he is. A lot of times we're encouraging people to keep seeking Jesus. And sometimes we need to shift our prayers and start to pray to the Father, right? Pray unto the Lord of harvest that he may send workers into his field. Sometimes we need to pray unto the Lord. Would you reveal yourself to those who are lost, to those who do not have hope, to those who are perishing? God, would you so have mercy on their soul and make yourself known to them? Because you said if you be lifted up, you will draw all men unto yourself. And so, Father, our prayer should be would you draw people unto yourself? But that's a different message, right? So he drew himself near and went with them, right? But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And in verse 17, he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood looking sad. Listen, this, what is this conversation you're holding? Ah, oh, man, I'm, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bring this out. It was illuminated to me by the Holy Spirit so crazily as I sat at my kitchen table, right? I never thought of it this way, never seen it this way, but my God, was it illuminated? And I think as we break this thing down, it is going to help some of us who have found ourselves in this place of hopelessness, in this place of disappointment in Christ. Because we believe that we placed our hope in him and been let down, right? But the first point I want to make is that even believers have moments of discouragement and hopelessness, even when hoping in Jesus. Even believers have moments of discouragement and hopelessness, even when hoping in Jesus. Listen, you are not uh, this, this one case. <laughs> Right? You don't need to go home and get on your knees and redo the sinner's prayer all over again and feel like you're not saved because you had a moment of being hopeless. Listen, believers struggle at times. Right, The disciples, the followers of Christ who seen him, heard his message, touched him, ate with him, sat with him, and he loved, they struggled with hopelessness, even being followers of Christ. Right, We're human. Circumstances come into this world. Circumstances hit us. And sometimes the weight of those things cause us to feel like there is no way out of this thing. You are not. Nothing's wrong with you. You're not. You're, you're not an illegitimate child. You're a person who feels pain and who hurts. Even believers have moments of discouragement and hopelessness. When hoping in Jesus, listen, that word sad, when it said that they stood looking sad, that word sad uh, 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 in the Greek is skoful post, and, and it implies looking gloom, sadness, and discouragement, and it reflects a state of mind. And so a disguised Jesus walks up to his followers about a conversation they were having, and they were sad. 
It's a reality of life sometimes. Circumstances uh, enter our lives and they weigh so heavy that we struggle to see a way out. Um, and, 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 and for the mature believer, it's not usually always like this small thing, right? There's this, now, there's levels of discouragement based upon our levels of maturity, right? Sometimes we just wake up and we didn't have bread in our house and we're discouraged. Right. Other times we can endure a lot of relationship pain, a lot of financial pain. Right. Sometimes for the mature believer, it's not the small things that gets us to this place of hopelessness. Sometimes it's major things. Right. And listen, these two men who were downcasted experienced a major event, a major circumstance in their life. That caused them to be downcasted and hopeless. Verse 18, it says, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Right. Listen, th listen, this event that has them feeling hopeless, this event that has them downcasted was so major that they thought it was odd that he did not know about it. They said, listen, are you not the only person in all of Jerusalem who has no clue what has happened in these past days? And then they explained to him what happens in verses 19 and 21. They says concerning Jesus of Nazareth. A man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we hoped, here it is, but we hoped, right? They delivered him to death and crucified, but we hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, this is now the third day since these things had happened. The crucifixion of Jesus stripped the disciples of all their hope. The reason they were downcasted, their leader was crucified. They said they crucified our leader, but we had hoped <laughs> that he was the, 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 the one who would redeem Israel. Right. The language implies that there was a hope that they no longer have. And the, because they no longer have that hope, their spirit is down. We followed this man. We believed this man. Andrew Simon ran after spending some time with Jesus and proclaimed, I have found the Messiah. Peter said, I don't know what the world is calling you. Some say Elijah, some say a prophet, but I know that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. They're like, listen, we have placed our hope in you. We have rebelled against the government. We have went towards the government and now our leader is crucified. And now we don't have no hope. What situations in your life has left you hopeless? Right? Hopelessness, we don't just wake up in the morning with hopelessness. There's something that has occurred in our life. And it could have, now we may wake up one morning feeling hopeless and like ain't nothing happened yet, but that's because an event that already happened is affecting your morning. And so when we start to feel hopeless, especially as believers, we have to say, what event in my life has occurred that has caused me to lose hope in Jesus? What have you placed your hope in and believed in and, and the situation just seemed dead, but you had hope that it would be better? And let me just ask this in the more controversial way. What situation have you placed your hope in Jesus in and that situation seems dead? That, that, now, whoa, somebody like, hold on, slow your roll, tread lightly, young fella, right? My, the old preachers are like, young man, tread lightly, right? Right? What situations have you placed your hope in Jesus in, and the situation seems dead, right? Now, we can be extra and act like you ain't feeling that way. Right? We can act like you ain't never felt like that. Uh, that you ain't never placed all your hope in Jesus and had a season where you was like, yo, Jesus, like, for real? Like, where you at? Right? Now, this is confusing to Jesus. See, these ideas, these thoughts are confusing to Jesus because he knows he hasn't failed. Jesus is walking up on these disciples who are downcasted because he's dead, and he's like, but I'm not dead. <laughs> Y'all are sad about what? <clears throat> Jesus is listening to the conversation like, what? wait, what we talking? What's the problem? Wait, your situation ain't dead? I am alive <laughs> in front of you. Jesus is like, Jesus is in heaven. Like, I'm not understanding why we're hopeless right now. The situation is very much alive. So he walks up, confused by the attitude of the conversation. And if we look back at verse 17, he asks the question, what is this conversation that you're holding? And I don't want you to miss the implications here. 
Jesus is asking the disciples about a conversation they are having about his death. Jesus walks up to the disciples who are having a conversation about his death, and he asks them, what is the conversation you're having? Now, this is what <laughs> it got illuminated. Jesus died. Jesus was crucified. Jesus knew very well about what the conversation was they were talking about. And so I'm going to suggest to you, stay with me, that the fact that Jesus asked them what was the conversation they was having was not him actually asking about the event that was taking place. Jesus was not concerned with the event that was taking place. Can I suggest to you today that Jesus was not asking them about what event took place. He was asking them about the nature of the conversation that they were having. What is this conversation that you are holding with this sadness in your spirit? What is this hopeless manifestation itself and sadness? What type of conversation are you having? He's walking up to sad and downcasted and hopeless followers of Christ and he's listening to the sadness and the downcastedness and the hopelessness in their speech and he's saying what is the nature of the conversation that you're having? What is this conversation that you're holding? Jesus was not concerned with an event. He was concerned with the state of his followers. Because remember, in John 20, 19, it tells us this, that it wasn't just these two walking on the road who struggled with hopelessness, downcastedness, and sadness, right? It tells us that it was actually the community of believers who were struggling with this. Because in John 20, 19, it says on that evening and that day, what evening and that day? The day, if you read John 20, the day that Mary went to the tomb and seeing that it was empty, right? It says the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. They were hiding. And don't forget, before that, they ran. Before that, they all deserted him. All but John. So the other disciples also had this state of mind about them that was fearful and downcasted, disappointed and hopeless. And guess what? Jesus was the cause of it for all of them. Jesus was the cause of their hopelessness. Jesus was the cause of their disappointment. Jesus was the cause of their fearfulness. Not that they were afraid of Jesus, but because they followed Jesus and rebelled against the government and did things and, and, and rebelled against the Jewish leaders as well and did things. Now he's gone. And so they're afraid because they were associated with the man who claimed to be the Messiah, the king of the Jews. And now he's crucified and we have put all our stake in him. Now they're like, what's our fate? Lock the doors. Jesus is the reason for all of this in these followers of his life. But Jesus wasn't concerned with the event. He was concerned with their disbelief of his followers. He was concerned that his followers disbelieved, not that the event happened, but that what was supposed to happen after the event. Because in Mark 16, 14, uh, he rebuked them when he finally got in the room with them. And he said, listen, I'm rebuking you because of their unbelief and their hardness of heart. What is this conversation that you are holding? Followers of Christ, what is this conversation that you are holding? What is this talk that you are having of hopelessness? What is this talk that you are having with each other of being downcasted and hopeless? What is, the con what is this conversation? Those who believe in Christ, the resurrected King, those who have placed our hope and trust in Christ for our salvation, you are feeling hopeless over situations. You trust me that, listen, listen, understand. You trust that when you die, you're going to raise from the dead. You trust that you're going to live in his eternal kingdom. You, trust, you put all your hope in me for that. But then when situations in your life change and go astray, you become hopeless. Wait a minute. You believe you're raised from the dead. You believe that this physical body will change and be shifted into immortality and be perfect. You believe that you'll stay in this kingdom that can nobody see. That you believe. But you're hopeless about your financial situations. You're hopeless about your marital situations. I can't fix none of that. Now, let me tread lightly here. So you believe the fairy tale. Because that's what, that's what unbelievers are saying. You believe this fairy tale. But then you won't believe that I can do this. What is the conversation that you are holding about me? Jesus says, disappointing you. Jesus doesn't understand this. Now listen, I can imagine, because of, those, because of my own personal struggles with 
with, uh, uh, with, with, with fears of rejection. Yeah, 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 I got issues. Mm -hmm. yep, I got issues, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I got to have my hope in Jesus. If I place it in man, I'll be in some type of institution. Listen, <laughs> listen, listen, listen. I can imagine the heartbreak Jesus might have felt walking up on the people he just died on the cross for and to hear them speaking in such a way that he failed them. What is the conversation that you're holding about me? I failed you. I disappointed you. I just left glory, put on flesh, got beaten and killed by my own creation, all so that I can save you. And I walk up and hear my followers, the people that was closest to me, the people I just died for, telling me that I disappointed and failed them. In the words of my wife, that's got to suck, yo. Anybody who's ever given their all to help somebody only to later have their name and efforts ran through the mud can imagine what Jesus must have felt walking into the middle of this conversation. This happened over 2,000 years ago, and today Jesus is still appearing in our conversations of hopelessness and disappointment, and he is asking us, what is this conversation that you are holding? He is not asking what we're talking about. He is asking, what is this hopelessness this hopeless talk that you are having as followers of Christ is one thing for the world to mock Jesus and say what he can't do and won't do. But for his image bearers, who's he actively sustaining and protecting and providing for what event in your life as a believer has caused you to lose hope in Christ for your situation? What is this conversation that you are holding? That's a question that we got to ask. What am I actually saying? As a believer, when I say, God, Jesus has disappointed me. What, what am I actually saying as a believer when I run the character of, of Christ through the mud? To the world, by the way. Because it is a character, it is an attack on his character to say that he failed you. Because his character says he's faithful. His character says he does not lie. And so when you say he's failed you, you are attacking his character. What is this conversation you are holding? The downcasted spirit is because of an event, which was the crucifixion of Jesus. But their sadness has less to do with, he's dying, with him dying and more to do with his death and what it appeared to rob them of. See, when Jesus died, it did something that affected Jerusalem. And the reason it affected the land is because when you read the Gospels, many people came to Jesus during his ministry. Many people followed Jesus because of his works and his message. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But more practically, for those persons feeling oppressed and isolated and imprisoned and sick and agony, he said in Luke 4 from the scroll of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and to open the prisons of those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn. People were following Christ because they needed deliverance and redemption, and he promised it to me. Oh, and then he died. We were hoping in you for our provision. We were hoping in you for our comfort. We were hoping in you to set us free. And you let us down, Jesus. Because you died. But, that, but, 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 that, but that's, that's, that's their story. Right? Because we know he's risen already. And so, but we still are hoping in him for deliverance. We still are hoping in him for provision. We still are hoping in him for comfort. And we feel sometimes let down. See, verse 21 says, but we hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. People followed Jesus because they hoped for what he promised he has sent, that he was sent to bring. And from their understanding, that's key, their understanding their hope of redemption died on the cross with Jesus. And many of us can relate. Believing God for something, placing your hope in him, only left feeling let down by an event that seemed to make your solution impossible. We're not, let's not front here today, y'all. Let's get free. We struggle with this. You may praise the Lord and do all of the great church words when you're in public, but in your quiet place, 
You struggle with being disappointed by Jesus sometimes. You struggle with being hopeful and putting place in your hope in Jesus sometimes. You ain't got a front to me. I know it's true because I deal with it as well. And maybe you better than everybody else I know. But I deal with it at times and I've talked to a lot of people every week. And it is a struggle of a lot of people. You've been felt let down. You felt let down. I'm using very careful words here. You felt let down by God. Those who are mourning and, 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 and do not feel comforted. Those who are oppressed and do not feel justified. We've been telling people that in Jesus you will be set free and yet in bondage for many people of color. We still live in it. Right? We've been telling people marriages will be sustained. If you keep Jesus as the foundation, he will sustain your marriage and marriages are still failing. We've been telling people to seek the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness and he will provide for you. Yet believers' lights are being cut off and some are even homeless. And so from our understanding, our hope has is failing us. And somebody's thinking that even right now. But remember I said the key word is our understanding. It's from our understanding that situations in our life cause us to lose hope in Christ and feel let down. But can I suggest that we lose hope in Christ and feel let down by Christ because we focus on our understanding of a situation instead of his promise? That's good. We lose hope in Christ and feel let down by, by Christ because we focus on our understanding of a situation instead of focusing on his promise. See, dead things stay dead. That's natural. That's a natural understanding to anybody. So Jesus died on the cross, hope is dead. Because dead things stay dead. But Jesus proclaimed to his disciples why he was still with them. That he would destroy this temple and he would rebuild it in three days. He already told them in Luke 9, 22, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, he would be raised. And now the situation has occurred. And they start thinking naturally instead of thinking on the promises. Now he's dead and they forget that he promised that he would raise on three on the third day. They are focusing on the their understanding of a situation, and their understanding of the situation is that dead things stay dead. But if they stop focusing on their understanding of the situation and start focusing on the promise of God, dead things be staying dead doesn't matter to them. They're going to still be hopeful because they know that Jesus promised he would raise, and natural understanding has nothing to do with the supernatural God. This is why we focus on what he has said, because I gave this passage last week. Remember Psalms 119, 49 and 50. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort and my affliction, that your promises give life. Oh, listen, we focus on the promises of God because the promises give us life. The situation may be dead, but God's promise is alive and it does not return void. Your situation may indeed appear to be dead, but God's promise is alive. His word is alive and it will not return to him void. If we only stop focusing on our understanding of the situation and start leaning into what we know God has spoken over our life, we can move from this hopeless spirit to hopeful. God told them he was going to raise. But all they can focus on was that he died. And they forgot that he promised he was going to. Oh, listen, listen. Can I tell you that if we let our natural eyes determine the faithfulness of Christ, we will always be let down and disappointed. I'm getting right out. But Jesus has never and never will let you down. Preach. Hope never died. Instead, there was a misunderstanding of application concerning his promise. You understand that? Hope never died. There was a misunderstanding thing, brother. Hope never died. Instead, there was a misunderstanding of application concerning the promises. Listen, the, pro the problem was not that Jesus died. The problem is not that hope died. The problem is not in Jesus failing to do what he said. The problem is always in how we understand what he said. Can I say it again? Many of us, like the followers of Christ back then, has concluded that hope is dead because we heard the word of God, we read the word of God, but we misunderstood its message. Hmm. So what happened in this case is that, 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 that when what the thing that we're hoping for doesn't manifest itself the way we thought it should, we become let down and downcast. But how many people here know that God doesn't do things the way we think they should be done? Yes, sir. Right? He does things the way he knows they need to be done. 
Let me prove it by jumping down to verse 25 and 27, right? After they tell Jesus all about this crucifixion, and we're gonna, I'm going to jump back to verse 22 in a minute, but after he tells them all about this, all they tell them all about the crucifixion, and they're downcasted, and they're sad. In verse 25, Jesus says, Oh, foolish ones. <laughs> hey, listen, they still don't know this is Jesus right now. He says, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The followers on the road said they had hoped he would redeem Israel, but he died. Jesus calls them foolish and begins to teach them from the scriptures the right understanding of what they already heard. Already heard. See, because like them, us, uh, uh, we misunderstand God's word. We place an expectation on God and then get, get disappointed when he doesn't meet it. Jesus explained that he had not failed. Rather, they have misunderstood the relationship between the crucifixion and his ability to redeem Israel. They had hoped that he would be the redemption of Israel, but he died. And when he died, their hope left. But it only left because they misunderstood the relationship between the crucifixion and his ability to actually redeem Israel. See, the concept of a suffering Messiah was not understood back then. See, when you think about Messiah and the one that's going to deliver us, you think, you think Moses in Egypt, <laughs> right? Coming in with a staff and we're going to bring these plagues and we're going to march out and march through the Red Sea and the water's going to cover up all of the Egyptian army. We, when we think, that's what we think about our Messiah. When we say we want God to show up in our life, we, that's the type of stuff we're talking about. So when they talk about a Messiah, they've been waiting on this Messiah for silence of 400 years. And then Jesus is born in Matthew 1, the birth of hope, by the way. The birth of hope in Matthew chapter 1. Because now the Messiah that they have been waiting on is now coming on the scene. But they didn't understand what he was really going to do. They were looking for a Moses type guy. And Jesus came with a whole other game plan. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But they didn't understand that the Messiah would have to suffer. In fact, Lee Strobel says when he was investigating Jesus, he made this argument. <clears throat> he said if he was who he said he was, why did he let him kill him? He could have stopped it. Right? In fact, the soldiers mocking Jesus on the cross in Luke 23, 37 said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. In other words, if you are the hope of Israel, the savior of Israel, you should be able to save yourself. The idea that the Messiah would suffer did not make any sense to them. But Jesus explained that the cross was necessary for redemption. The fact that Jesus had to walk them through all the scriptures to remind them of the suffering suffer, uh, Messiah is foretold in all the scriptures proves that they didn't have an understanding. Now, if I was there, I can imagine that he read from Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, which says, surely our griefs. He himself bore in our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced through our, through our, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. Or maybe he reminded them of what he already said in Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't fail them. It was the process of their redemption. Just because Jesus is working in a way that is unconventional doesn't mean he's failed us. It just means he's doing it in a way that he knows is guaranteed to produce the desired outcome. Just because Jesus is working in a way that is unconventional doesn't mean he's failed us. The cross became to them the death of hope. But the truth is that the cross is the conduit. In order to redeem us, he had to purchase us, and the cost to buy our lives back was his life. In order to liberate us, he had to defeat the thing that held us, but you can't defeat sin and death until he rose, right? But you can't have a resurrection before you have a death, right? The situation appeared to be dead, but it was the conduit of life. Your situation may appear to be dead, but it is producing life. It is producing your solution. This is important for us to remember. It is important for us to make the connection between how God is materializing what we are hoping for in our current situations. 
missing it has caused us to fall and, and be forsaken uh, and to feel forsaken rather by God which leads to disappointment and hopelessness some of the things we are hoping from God comes through hardship and suffering Things have to die in us sometimes to get that deliverance. Things have to die in us. <laughs> Things have to die in us sometimes to get that. Things have to die in our spouses sometimes to get that healthy marriage. Things have to die in our finances to lean on, on, on Jesus. The, the, there is purpose in our pain. And I'm reminded of the words of the psalmist in Psalms 119.71. It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. And I know this is hard to accept. Peter couldn't accept it when Jesus said it about himself. <laughs> so certainly we don't like it when it pertains to our actual life. But let me give you three reasons why there is a misunderstanding at times between what God promises and what God is actually doing. Right? The first one is desperation doesn't allow us to see perspective. Desperation doesn't allow us to see perspective. See, in desperation, we expect the healing and deliverance to happen in a way that we desire it to happen because we're the ones being afflicted and need relief, right? Because we are desperate for a solution, we are blinded by any perspective that is not producing the immediate result the way we think it should be produced. We want God to fix our marriages, which is cold for fix our spouses. <laughs> and so because our spouses haven't changed, we become hopeless, right, right? But what if God is saying, in order to fix your marriage, I got to first deal with you? But that's not what we wanted, right? Right? And, and, and we want God to give us deliverance, right? Which is cold word for vengeance. We don't want to just be delivered. We want payback. And so when God just delivers us, we got a problem. It ain't fair, though, right? We don't want equality, right? We want privilege. <laughs> Right? See, when we hope in how we want God to fix it, we miss that he is actually doing what we have hoped for. The process just looks different. And that's the second reason. The second reason is God's ways are unconventional to human logic. Right? Human logic says that the Messiah should redeem them. Uh, uh, and like I told you before, from, from the history, uh, the people that delivered them, it, they did it by, by a mighty sword. <laughs> Right. And so it makes no logical human sense that in order to deliver and redeem somebody, you have to first die. Right. Human uh, 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 God's ways are unconventional to human logic. And the third way reason is God. Here, and this one, this one, this gets to the really core. God is concerned with the core of the problem and we are only concerned with the problem. Mm. See, because God is concerned with the core of the problem, and we are only concerned with the problem, we miss what God is doing. God, we want you to fix this symptom, and God is saying, I'm trying to deal with the disease. See, check this out. God, see, 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 because they wanted this Messiah like Moses. They wanted this deliverance by sword and power, right? But check this out. God delivered, the, delivered them from the Egyptian army, and he freed Israel. Guess what? That didn't stop them from being oppressed by all these other nations afterwards. Right? And so God said, listen, I can keep freeing you from people or I can die that I may drag all men to myself and by the power of the gospel transform them hearts so that instead of them oppressing you, they will liberate and be your advocate and live at peace with you. He said, listen, I can keep by sword defeating this stuff, but if I can just deal with the heart issue, if I can deal with the disease of mankind, then I don't have to keep defeating your enemies. I will change your enemies and they will become your friend. God says, I can bless you with a house, but you have no appreciation of value of things. You're not grateful for anything. And so if I give you a house, you'll just destroy it. But if I strip you of everything for a season, then when you receive it, You'll know how to appreciate it. See, there's an underlying heart issue that is producing a symptom that we're asking God to change. And God is saying, I'm trying to deal with the actual disease. here," And that means he's got to cut hook deep. That means he just can't fix our problems. Right? That means he has to reveal to us why our problems are problems in the first place. I never forget when me and my wife was having marital issues and that, that year one, year two, and then we was contemplating divorce. <laughs> Listen, for those who watching, 
Me and my wife came back from, I, we tell everybody this and they think we're lying, but when we do premarital counseling, we tell everybody this. Me and my wife came back from the honeymoon and asked our pastor for a divorce. I'm not lying, this is valid. <laughs> Did y'all hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. We came back from our honeymoon, that means right after we got married, <laughs> and asked our pastor for a divorce. Right? And I remember that first year being rough and hard and it was struggling. And I remember praying to God. And I remember being in tears one night praying to God about, about my marriage. And I remember as clear as day, God said, love your wife. And what he was doing in that season, it was painful. It was hurtful. It wasn't a good season. I was hurting my wife. She was hurting me, not physical. <laughs> what he was doing in that season was actually what I was hoping for him to do. But check this out. Because he didn't just snap his fingers and fix our problems, we had to go through it. Our marriage is what it is today because of what we learned in that season that we did not like. And it looked dead. I didn't understand every day. I'm sleeping on the couch. I don't understand every day why we're still doing this thing. I'm calling my dad. I'm trying to move back home with my dad. My dad like, boy, you ain't come to my house. You better figure it out. Listen, when my dad tells me to figure it out, I need to figure it out. <laughs> And our marriage is what it is today because of what we learned in that season. And so God was like, I can deal with the problem, but I'm trying to give you a solution that will sustain you. Listen, I can deliver you from your enemies, Israel, but if I die on the cross, I can give a sustainable redemption from all times. You will never, ever again be in captivity. You will never, ever again be in bondage to the heart issue or the disease. Because Jesus is not concerned with behavior management. He is concerned with transformation. So we want Jesus to manage our behaviors. And Jesus is saying, I'm not trying to transform the heart. See, the cross was the only way to stop managing issues and start transforming people so that they no longer want to do the things that were oppressive and sinful. And so Jesus opened their eyes to understand that even though it was unconventional, if he had not died, there could be no redemption. Jesus is teaching them to not look at the crucifixion event and think that all hope is lost. For the word says that it must happen like this. And then redemption comes. So I don't know what your cross is, but it must die for you to be redeemed. It must die for you to be liberated. It must die for you to be healed and made whole. Uh, uh, they should have been rejoicing at the crucifixion instead of mourning it. Stop looking at your hardships and trials as all hope being lost and begin to see them as God actually working. You can run from the cross in your season, but your deliverance is through it. Your healing is through it. Your desired outcome is not around it, but through it. And every time you try to go around it, you prolong that season. And so that's what I stopped by to tell y'all this afternoon. That what the resurrection of Jesus reminds us is that even when it looks hopeless, Everything is happening according to its plan. Now, 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 quickly, let me talk to the person who is hopeless with the solution right next to them. Because there's one thing to be hopeless, but then there's another thing to be hopeless when your solution is right in front of you. Notice that hope was talking to them. See, in order to walk in hope, we must not reject it. See, uh, uh, something earlier in this text stood out to me. Because remember, um, when, she, when Mary went to the tomb in John 20, Jesus appeared to her. She thought it was a gardener. And he asked her, why are you weeping? And then he began to tell her that he's alive. And the Bible says she went and told the other disciples. Okay, now you missed it. Let me explain something to you. What we're reading about on this road of Emmaus happened after that. <laughs> And we know it happened after that because in verse 22 and 23, they say, moreover, some women of company amazed us, right? Some of our people. Listen, our people, not some stranger. She's part of us, right? right? Your pastor is trying to give you hope, right? And you're rejecting it. Your, your church family is trying to give you hope and you're rejecting it. People of your company. Right? They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a, a vision of angels who said that he was alive. 
So the men sat and downcasted, having a conversation with each other and then Jesus, about Jesus, and they were hopeless because of it, and saddened because of it, and downcasted because of it, but they had already got the report that he was alive. But they did not receive it. See, some of us have the solution of our hopelessness, but we reject it. The reason that they rejected it is because they did not believe the unconventional ways of God and therefore they chose to remain hopeless. They, rem they chose to remain hopeless by refusing to believe the account of their hope. See, are you hopeless? And maybe God has sent testimony to you that he's working it out, but you refuse to hear it. You, know how, you don't know how many times I have conversations with people and I'm giving them what I feel like God is downloading to me. Right? And I'm sharing what I believe God is telling me that he's trying to do in their life through their situations. But remember, desperation doesn't allow for you to see perspective. Right? And I'm trying to explain to them what I see God doing in their life and they reject the testimony. And then they remain hopeless. See, they were hopeless and sad about the death of Jesus in the evening of the day that in the morning they got the testimony that he rose. They remain sad because they rejected the message of hope. And this is another reason why Jesus is, what is this conversation you're having? Why are you talking about a dead Jesus? Didn't I send Mary back to you to tell you that I'm risen? Why is in the evening you're talking about I'm dead? Jesus is so confused by the conversation that his followers are having. What is this conversation you are having? You're not just saying that Jesus lets you down. You're also, let me, let me, I don't want to say this. You can't say that Jesus has let you down while you reject the testimony that he has. I get his perspective. Nobody wants to hear pain through my, uh, 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 uh. nobody wants to hear healing through my suffering. <laughs> nobody wants to hear that. I'm sorry. I don't want to hear it either. But it doesn't change the reality. It doesn't change it. Jesus had to die in order that we may receive the things that we need from him, the redemption that we need from him, the deliverance that we need from him. And listen, Jesus came to show us the way. And so sometimes, listen, our, 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 our answer is going to be through hardships. Right in front of us sometimes is the solution. And we reject it. And I, I, I'm, I'm guilty, homie. Huh? get mad. I'm mad at God. I know that this is how you're doing it, but that's not how I want it done. And so I, I don't do it the way that I, I'm, I really need it this way. And then I'm on my knees praying, saying, God, why you not? And God is like, ah, the solution is you are rejecting the testimony. Maybe you're more mature than me. Uh, I just got to do better. <laughs> but again, if you were part of the majority, we got to do and accepting the testimony of how God is actually bringing the thing we're asking him for. Even if we don't like the conduit in which he, even if we don't like that, it's by way of the cross. Let's close this thing out. But now Jesus spends some time with them, and he breaks bread with them, and he leaves them with open eyes, and they realize that Jesus is alive. And in verse 28 through 34, he says this. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. He's like, I'm, I'm going to keep it moving, y'all. They're like, no, come, come hang with us. He acted. He was always going to kick it with them for the day. These was his people, right? But they urged him to, uh, strongly saying, stay with us, for it is towards evening and the day is now far spent. So he went and he stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and broke it and, and blessed it and broke it and he gave it to them. Verse 31, and their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from them sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn with him while we walked and talked with him on the road while he opened up the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven. Where was the eleven at? In the house doors locked. And, and, and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. They realized that hope was alive and they ran to proclaim it to those who were in the house fearful. Listen, I'm standing here today on this Resurrection Sunday to proclaim to you that Jesus is alive. 
Hope is alive. I'm standing here today to tell you that I've lived through the toughest days, right? I've lost a child. I've despised being married. I've been loved only to be broken. I've been broken and homeless. I've been through uh, uh, some of the toughest things. I believed the lies about myself. People told me I couldn't be nothing. I believed I wouldn't be nothing. Let me tell you something. I sat in the bathroom with a loaded pistol contemplating death. Listen, I'm not making this up. My story is verified and can be verified. But let me tell you something else. One day my eyes was open. To realize that Jesus is my hope. And when I put my trust in him, all of those things turned around. The only message I know is Christ is our hope. And the resurrection is why we can be sure in it. His resurrection reminds us that he has not failed us. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be downcast. That our Savior, our hope is alive and on the throne. And even if it seems hopeless... He is working on your situation. Stay grounded, stay focused, and keep believing because he lives, our hope lives. And then my favorite verse in this passage, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. This is so important because remember in John 19, the text says that they were fearful. And so Jesus comes into their sadness. Jesus comes into their hopelessness and fears and brings with his presence peace. That's a sure sign that you're in the presence of the Lord. That in the midst of chaos, anxiety, problems in your life, nothing's going right. There's peace. When that peace rushes in, Jesus is present. Get with him. Spend time with him. Don't rush that time. But then check this out. Um, in John 20, right after he, he said that, he said, as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. He gives the same people who were fearful and who abandoned him and who were locked in a room and who said that he disappointed them a commission to go into the world and proclaim hope and salvation in no other name but Jesus. And what happened? They went and turned the world upside down. Why am I saying that? What, if, what is the connection? Do you know what you can do with a little bit of hope? It's the power of hope, the power of hope that you can take downcasted and fearful and hopeless people and they turn it around and listen, the same people that they were locked in their house afraid of, they now are in front of proclaiming boldly, Jesus has risen. Hope is a powerful tool in the hands of the righteous. The acts of the apostles are amongst the greatest evidences of the resurrection of Jesus. The transformation from fearful to boldness can only be accounted for if they truly believe that they had saw the resurrection Christ, their hope. They went from cowards to staring in the face of the same people who crucified their Savior and boldly proclaiming Jesus has risen from hopeless to world changers. And the key piece is that hope was restored when the resurrected Jesus came into their presence. And so whatever's going on in our life, whatever's happening in our life, whatever's happening in our life, the resurrection of Jesus is a reminder that it is not hopeless. Or it may look hopeless. It may look like a dead situation. It may look like he's failed you. It may look like he's disappointed you. But our God never disappoints he is still present working. He is still alive working. He is still bringing about the thing that you are hoping in him for. Whatever he has spoken in your life, whatever he has promised in your life, you cannot allow the, the, situ the current situations to cause you to forget his promises. He is a faithful God. He does not fail. He does not change his mind. He does not backpedal. Because he lives, we can be hopeful in our situation, trusting that God is working. And no matter what the season looks like, no matter how dead it appears, it is not hopeless because he lives. How many of us believe that? He is risen. He is alive. He is risen. He is alive. You, you got to say that. He is risen. He is alive. Put it in the comments. Hashtag it. He is risen. He is alive. And what that means is that hope, the manifestation of hope in the person of Jesus Christ is alive. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that we can trust in you. I thank you that no matter what is happening around us in this world, no matter what our circumstances say, no matter how dead they appear, God, I am thankful that you are alive 
and that we can hope in you. I am thankful that you are solid and secure. I am thankful that you are faithful. I am thankful that I do not have to believe the testimony of my circumstance, but I have the testimony of your word to hang on to and your promises are sure because the Bible says that the promises of God are yes and amen. Amen.